life and redefine their own uh, existence and their own uh, communities in this early Iron Age context. So the theme here is really about change and continuity, both in trying to understand these uh, dynamics. And really the takeaway point is that what we see and what we're beginning to better appreciate is that these Eastern, these communities in this uh, Eastern Mediterranean context, which also include uh, contemporaries like the biblical uh, cultures of the Israelites to the South, the Phoenicians, you will also see the rise of the Assyrians, the great Neo-Assyrian Empire. It is a period of time of great cultural innovation. This is when we start to see uh, new ideas, very important and influential, uh, ultimately like monotheism, but also new technologies around communication, like the development of the alphabet, the development of maritime and other economic commercial uh, technologies that really expand economic opportunity and productivity. It's a very dynamic and fertile and uh, innovative time. And it's within that context that I want to try and um, place and contextualize some of our recent discoveries at Taina. So let me specifically uh, geographically locate ourselves. And um, you see here a map that essentially provides the anticipated boundaries or spatial or territorial extent of the Hittite Empire, which was one of these great Bronze Age territorial states that I was alluding to, controlled much of central Anatolia, extending during its greatest expansion down into Western Syria and what we call the Northern Levant, the Eastern Mediterranean seaboard that you see uh, running along the um, Eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea there. When the empire, the Hittite empire collapsed sometime, we're not exactly sure of the precise date, but sometime around 1200, maybe as late as middle of the 12th century into the early uh, mid 11th hundreds, we start to see, and based on our research, a better understanding of what starts to emerge. It's a series of tiny, I often have referred to them as diminutive kingdoms. And uh, we're beginning to outline the geographical, the political, and in some sense, the cultural parameters of some of these little kingdoms. These kingdoms emerge out of the aftermath of the collapse of this great territorial state or empire of the Hittites. And the one that I wanna focus on here, if you can see my cursor, is what has only recently begun to be identified as a place called the land or possibly the kingdom of Palestine. Now we know quite a bit about one of these other kingdoms centered at Carchemish that you might see here on the upper reaches of the Euphrates River. It was referred to in ancient sources as the land or the kingdom of Hatti. And it's been only in the last 10 to 15 years as a result of in, uh, discoveries, including very important inscriptions that were found up on the citadel at the site of Aleppo, a big modern city of Aleppo, right in the core of the ancient medieval town is a large archeological site that carries and preserves archeological remains going back all the way into the Bronze Age. So we are beginning to discover and learn more about the political history. It's almost like lifting the veil off of this dark age. We're beginning to fill in some of the political history of this period from roughly 1200 down to about 900. And one of the very exciting discoveries that has come from those new inscriptions and new discoveries has been the realization that there seems to have been a very important kingdom centered in the area that my cursor is. And it was referred to by local indigenous sources as Palestine. And uh, to anticipate where I'm gonna go with this, our site, if you can see it there, Tainat, the archeological site, seems to have been the capital and ultimately the royal city of this kingdom or land of Palestine. So these are very recent discoveries all made within the past 15, um, in, uh, 15 to 10 uh, years. And so it's a very dynamic and exciting time as an archeologist, as a historian of this period uh, to be doing research in this area, given the fact that our knowledge is changing literally on a year by year basis as we go forward. I must also note, if you are certainly aware of, the, of this location, that we're also in a very complex part of the world. This is also um, right on the sort of edge, on the border of the ongoing uh, conflicts, civil war 
in Syria. So this is a very um, complex uh, part of the Middle East, and it has been for thousands of years. And that's another important dimension of our research as we try to learn and understand better what is happening in the past. Um, it's our um, belief that that understanding can help us better understand how it contributes these deeply rooted and longstanding um, dynamics, how they continue to inform and, and, and influence um, some of the modern and contemporary situations, issues, and conflicts there in that region today. So let's begin to zoom in. Uh, this little box marks the area that is the focus of our research. It's in the northern part of the Orontes Valley in the classical era, it was known as the Plain of Antioch. And uh, so most of you, if not all of you, have surely heard of the ancient city of Antioch, which was rival to Rome in its heyday in the, in the classical period. Um, hundreds of thousands of people, a very rich and affluent and powerful city with many famous philosophers, uh, artisans, um, political figures, a very uh, significant place in the ancient uh, classical era. And if you follow this red line east, from Antioch, just about 20 kilometers to the east is the site of Tainot and its sister settlement of Tel Achana, which together form a kind of uh, complementary or twin settlement that spans the entire Bronze and Iron Ages. So if you're trying to understand what is happening in this region during the Bronze and Iron Ages, these two sites together are really important. They're essentially a bellwether that helps us get a window into the changing dynamics of the Bronze and Iron Age period. So they're really important strategically, but also um, archeologically and historically, they're very important places. And thus um, they've been the focus of, of research for a long time. Here you can see an aerial photograph of Tainat. What you're actually looking at here, if you can see my cursor, is what we will be focusing on the upper mound. It's about 20 hectares. You probably can't see it, but there is a much larger, you might almost see a shadow here, depending on how good your, your video is. Um, there is a much larger settlement here that's now buried under the floodplain of the nearby river. So this is the Orontes River winding its way past out to the Mediterranean. And uh, the site is, at least in the modern period, about a kilometer away. And much of this area around it is in the floodplain of the river. And so what has happened is that most of the archaeological site is now buried, literally, um, by the rising alluviation of the floodplain over millennia. So it's very, the, the proverbial tip of the iceberg is what you're seeing here. There's a much larger site essentially buried under that alluvium. As I mentioned or alluded to, Tainat and other sites like Achana nearby uh, which you can see in this uh, photograph. Uh, it's an amazing photograph from the 1930s in the background. You might be able to see the other mound and you might see this little black blob where my cursor is. That's the excavation house of Leonard Woolley, famous British archeologist who was directing excavations at Achana, which is ancient Avalok. At the same time that a team from the University of Chicago, their Oriental Institute, was directing these large scale excavations that you see here in the foreground, part of what's known as the Syrian Hittite expedition. They conducted these large scale excavations between 1935 and 1938. You can see perhaps, depending on your screen, there's even track, we call it a Decaville. Uh, they, they basically um, put up a whole sort of system to try and help expedite the removal of the archaeological soils as they excavated. They involved hundreds of people. It was an industrial scale kind of excavation. If I dare say uh, something straight out of an Indiana Jones kind of movie, that kind of a uh, setting is very much what, um, what we're looking at here. So these were very important excavations back in the 1930s. One other quick point while I have this photograph, you might see this white line sort of running across the plain. That's the main highway, it's the ancient highway from Antioch, from modern day Antakya to Aleppo. So Aleppo is about a 70 kilometers further uh, to the east. Um, and Tainat and Achana, the two sites here, are sort of midway uh, between the two, um, these two um, ancient settlements. Those Chicago excavations were large scale, as I said, 
and focused on the upper mound, the Royal Citadel, and uncovered a series of large palaces and temples. I'm really not going to spend much time talking about them, but monumental architecture. And this is one of the salient characteristics of what we're going to call the Neo-Hittite culture, which was the local indigenous culture of this early Iron Age period. And you can see here a column base with beautifully carved stone uh, uh, engravings on this column base. And this is a characteristic of this period. They were very interested and highly um, motivated to produce monumental sculpture, monumental relief, monumental buildings. Um, and they also produced some of the most spectacular fine art, luxury art objects, whether in gold and other precious metals, whether in ivories, in stone. We find throughout the Mediterranean during this period, uh, some of the finest works of art um, probably coming from Tainat and from some of these other Levantine cities, either being brought away in trade and tribute or as booty from campaigns and military uh, expeditions. Much of this stuff you can see now in museums, whether in Europe, North America, like the Met, the British Museum, the Louvre, and so forth. One of the other important points I want to emphasize here before we move into our own excavations is that the Chicago excavations in the 1930s, despite their scale, and they were certainly moving uh, the archaeological dirt off the mound at a kind of stunning, breathtaking pace, but they also stopped before they began to really, I think, get down into some of the earlier periods that I think we're particularly interested in, certainly into this dark age period from 1200 down to around 900 that I've been referring to. Yet there were hints that there was significant earlier material, and I use this photograph to try and make this point. Here you see a young fellow standing next to a massive column base carved again out of stone, specifically basalt, sitting on the surface of the mound, which clearly indicated that there was much more still to be found. This was never located in any kind of context by the Chicago expedition. Secondly, they also uncovered about 100 fragments of what we know as and refer to as hieroglyphic Luvian. Now, most of you have probably heard about Egyptian hieroglyphics, maybe other types of uh, American, you know, let's say Colombian or South American um, hieroglyphic traditions. There's actually a not so well known hieroglyphic tradition associated with ancient Anatolia, referred to as Luvian. And you, here you see some uh, fragments, a very important fragment that was excavated in the 1930s, discovered by the Chicago team. I will come back to this piece a little bit later, but I just want to highlight now that in those early excavations, they found about 100 fragments of this material. So very important inscriptions, but found in essentially what I would refer to as a tertiary context. So they didn't come from the context in which they had been uh, carved or installed or erected on the site. And so trying to understand their significance from a cultural and historical perspective was something that the early excavators really were not able to do. But it, again, hints that there was quite important things still to be found. And as you can perhaps imagine where I'm going with this, it's the kind of thing that drew some of us uh, to the site. Part of the reason why we wanted to go to this site was because we believed there was much more uh, to be discovered, much more to be done there. And that led to our own work um, beginning, uh, as I will describe in a, in a short, uh, in a few minutes. Just a couple more comments to make in the broader uh, historical and cultural context. In addition to these early excavations, we actually have contemporary sources, particularly from the Assyrians who I mentioned earlier. They, um, starting in around 911 BCE, began recording annual events, what we call the eponym list, and so we actually have a lot of political or military history for what was happening in this region already as early as the 10th century and continuing down to the 9th and 8th and 7th centuries, coinciding with the rising and waning fortunes of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And in our context of this northern uh, Levantine or northern Orontes Valley context of Tainot, we happen to know quite a bit about the political history of this tiny little kingdom of Palestine or Patin or Unki as it was referred to by the Assyrians. And we already, before we even began our investigations, had a fragmentary king list. We knew the names of about a half a dozen different uh, rulers associated with this 
um, ancient kingdom. So that we actually knew there was something there, even if archaeologically we didn't have a whole lot that we could associate with it. So our expedition uh, began, uh, we began with uh, 1999 with what we call uh, surface survey. We conducted intensive surface collection of pottery and other material culture that was on, this, on the surface of the mound. As I alluded to earlier, because so much of the site is actually buried under the alluvium, that creates a lot of uh, methodological challenges for us, which we like, it, and it forces us to develop innovative methods to try and approach the site and strategies for excavation. That included not only the surface collection, but we did an elaborate coring work. You can see these, perhaps these little yellow dots. These are all part of an uh, intensive coring um, uh, project that we did. We also used various kinds of what we refer to as remote sensing methods, uh, uh, geomagnetic uh, resistivity and others uh, to try and see if we can map and get a sense of what was below the surface before we actually began conducting any kind of excavations. And you can see uh, just on the right side of the slide here, a kind of composite image of some of the linear features as we refer to them that we were able to begin mapping if essentially in this, I don't know if it's visible on for you on the slide, but this sort of red enclosed space here, that's what's being depicted over here on the right. So we knew just from this surface work, this remote sensing, that there's an extensive community or settlement out in this area that's now covered by the floodplain of the nearby river. And you can, of course, tell that over here where you can see the contours, there is uh, obviously an upper mound that protrudes above the surface of the plain. And it's in this area with the kind of light blue shaded area, which was the focus of the Chicago excavation. So that photograph that I showed earlier, that's where those excavations were conducted. And I'll move, as I move through the next set of slides, I'm gonna be focusing on this area, literally right smack dab in the middle of the upper mound or citadel area, right on the edge of the Chicago excavations, which is where I'm gonna focus our, my talk for the rest of the time that I have and the discoveries that relate to the um, specific topic I want to focus on uh, this afternoon. So here's a close up. Uh, this uh, plan shows you some of these large uh, buildings that the Chicago team excavated, the palaces and other monumental or public buildings I showed the slide of earlier. Our excavations have focused around the edge of their excavations in part because we're trying to resolve many uh, issues and questions that came out of their excavations around things like stratigraphy, the development of the pottery sequences. I'm not gonna bore you, I suppose, with those kinds of details this afternoon. These are the things that archeologists actually get quite excited about, uh, arguing about whether pottery is ninth century or 10th century and so on and so forth. And so a big reason why we focused our early excavations in this area where I have the red circle was to try and see if we could resolve longstanding arguments and debates around the chronology and the phasing and so forth that uh, had been uh, the product of those earlier excavations. But in the course of those excavations, we found new dramatic discoveries, including this building you can see here with the Roman numeral 16, building 16, which is a temple. Building two, while I have this slide, is also a temple. This building was excavated in the 1930s and it's long been held as a kind of um, analogous or a parallel for the Solomonic temple in Jerusalem. I won't have time to talk about this this afternoon, but our, one of our unexpected and really quite exciting discovery was um, this building 16, which is a similar temple, producing two of them uh, parallel or uh, perpendicular to each other, contemporary, sorry, to each other um, with some very important discoveries actually that have um, a lot of importance for uh, discussions around uh, religious uh, institutions and religious practices of the Iron Age uh, contemporaneous with the Solomonic Temple in uh, Jerusalem. But I'm gonna have to leave that for now. We don't have time to go into that topic. I just show you here an aerial photograph looking south. This is actually the, our new temple that's 16. And um, you might see a little pavement here. And it was on this pavement that we found a host of artifacts, cultic paraphernalia, kind of a Pompeii a primary context for revealing um, the kinds of ritual activities that were going on in this temple. This is why it was so exciting. It also included a, a kind of a metro newspaper size cuneiform tablet that produced very important insights into 
um, ritual and uh, religious life in this context, but something that I don't have time to discuss today. What I want to focus on with the time I have left is in this area where you see the red circle, which is more or less sort of in the space between the two temples. As we began excavating down between them, we were hoping to get a sense of the earlier sequence. Again, uh, the kind of thing that we as archaeologists are quite interested in. And that's when a whole nother set of surprises were in store for us. Starting in 2011, 2012, um, some of our more recent field seasons, we began excavating in this other area and discovered just a series of absolutely jaw-dropping, spectacular sculptures. What you're looking at here is a lion for scale, you can see the little scale at the bottom there. That is about, I think it's about 25 to 30 centimeters. This line is a, more than a meter and a half in height. He was in pristine condition, not so much as a scratch on him. And if you're interested in art history, one of the things that's so spectacular about this, and this speaks again to the larger question or comment I made earlier about the sort of innovative nature and the cultural um, expression of these early Iron Age kingdoms. And that is that we have here, um, and from a sort of aesthetic perspective, the production of monumental sculptures, in this case of a lion, that from this time, roughly about 1000 or 900 BCE, is unparalleled anywhere in the world. Uh, so you have these tiny little kingdoms that were producing um, a level of artistic production that is, was unheralded um, on, uh, in human history and human experience up until this time. So there's some amazing things going on. Again, I just don't have time to develop all of this. This is another whole series of uh, talks we could give focusing on this kind of artistic um, uh, phenomenon of these, these tiny little kingdoms that were producing both uh, fine art, small uh, scale luxury art goods and objects but also monumental sculptures. Here's just a second one that was found actually. So we should have known, we, were, we should have expected, I suppose, to find these, it was completely unexpected. But in the 1930s excavation, the Chicago team also found, um, if I can be partisan a little bit, not quite as spectacular as our find, but um, also nevertheless still a truly spectacular, um, what we call a double lion a column base. You can see here the circle behind it. There would have been a column standing up on this, and this stood in the entrance to building two, that temple that I showed in the previous slide. And it's as though these two lion sculptures were carved in the same workshop. They're so striking down to the whiskers, down to the main, um, the, down to the details. One of the things that's rather curious as an aside is that whoever carved these probably hadn't seen a real lion or if they had had not gotten close enough to look in their mouth, because they have human molars in, the, in these lions, which of course are not anatomically or physiologically correct. And those of you who have happened to get close enough to a lion to see. Other um, sculptures that we began uncovering in this area over the next two or three field seasons included this large column base. It's a, it would have supported a, probably a wood um, column for the entrance to a building. We don't have anything more but the piece um, for scale. That's about 15 centimeters, so a, quite a large piece. What you're looking at here is a winged bull. This is a side view. And then next to it is a sphinx. These are kind of uh, mythical uh, creatures. Again, kind of a religious theme. Uh, very important uh, sculpturally as well as iconographically. I haven't got time, unfortunately, to develop it further. Another important piece that was broken that we found, and here I have my um, colleague, assistant director, uh, Elif Denel standing for scale, but next to her is this large piece of a broken up uh, column uh, statue base. Um, and it's a little bit hard to see perhaps here, but if I show you a parallel from a nearby contemporary site called Zinjuli, what you're looking at is this piece here. And what we have is the broken piece. There's a kind of hole in the top where a statue would have been anchored or deposited or pivoted into to uh, provide some kind of support. And the motifs that you see here are two lions with a human figure holding them. It's the classic ancient Near Eastern motif of the master and the lions or master and the animals motif. It's a kind of symbol of civilization and the subduing of uh, the chaotic forces of nature, if you will. It's a very, very ancient motif 
uh, these motifs, if you will, going back really to the beginning of the earliest cultures of the, of the ancient Near East. And then uh, one more uh, sculpture uh, for now, uh, and that is this male statue um, that we found uh, again in the same area as we were excavating. And uh, I won't have time to, again, to go into the full details of this, but this is actually a, a representation of a human figure. And in fact, um, uh, well, first you can see the eyes is one of the things that's really quite striking. Uh, and if you go into the museum, it's, it's become a very iconic piece um, in Turkey today. Uh, you can actually find um, in gift shops all over the country now, <laughs> various kinds of paraphernalia that have been made uh, imitating this person, this figure. I think what's drawn people's attention is the kind of mesmerizing view that the eyes had. When you come to the statue, it just draws you in. But it's a very large, uh, that you can see uh, for scale, it's about a meter across on the, at the base here. So um, more than a meter in height. This, if, if the proportions would have held the full statue, whether standing or seated, would have probably been at least three meters, maybe three or four meters or more. On his back, we have one of these hieroglyphic inscriptions. And I just wanna note here, um, this symbol, I'm gonna come back to this at the end of my talk. It's what we refer to as the first person uh, pronoun or singular first person, I, I am. And so it's an inscription that we might sort of loosely characterize as an autobiographical statement. In other words, on carved on his body, we're told who it is, and it says, I am Shupiluliuma. So it tells us he was a, uh, a king or a ruler by the name of Shupiluliuma. And then he proceeds to tell us all, of course, of his amazing accomplishments, if you will, um, as a king. And here is a translation. Um, it's very difficult uh, to translate. Um, the, this is uh, the Luvian, hieroglyphic Luvian language is actually a language um, that very, very few scholars um, have been able to work with, um, probably less than two dozen who are truly um, knowledgeable and competent. It's a very exclusive club, if you will, of uh, scholars who can read these texts. And so there's a lot of, um, a lot of the language, both its grammar, but also the um, vocabulary that we still don't know. But essentially this inscription, the part that we have, indicates some of the, lists some of the accomplishments. He talks about erecting border posts, taking lots of cities and so forth. Pretty sort of predictable kinds of bravado that you might expect from a petty king in this region in the early first millennium. The part I wanted to highlight though very briefly is that we have now found two fragments. This is one of them, a second I don't have a slide of to show at the moment that preserves part of the name of the place, specifically Palestine or Wallestine. That's the name I gave at the beginning of my talk. And so we have now inscriptions that actually were found on the site in the local indigenous language that tells us who, what they named the place. And so this is a very important thing for us, obviously, to be able to um, address that larger question about what was happening. Was there such a kingdom? And was it located in this region? We now have a growing number of inscriptions, including actually three from Taina. Because if you remember this slide from the beginning of my talk, um, this was found by the Chicago team. And in fact, um, they found part of the name up here um, without fully recognizing it at the time. This is part of the wonder of, and excitement of our field. Um, things that we might uh, not understand, obviously, um, with new discoveries begin to take on a whole new meaning. And this is again, uh, the point I'm coming to with our last, uh, the, the, the last uh, artifact that I wanna focus on, our most recent discovery. So just to summarize very briefly, uh, a growing number of inscriptions, both from the, within the site, but also from within the region, including inscriptions, for example, from the Citadel at Aleppo that I mentioned, are beginning to fill in uh, some of the political history. And we're starting to have the names of a growing number of kings and these inscriptions are giving us a, a kind of a, a, a history that's extending back into that so-called uh, dark age. So uh, I'm not gonna belabor that histor history right now, but we believe that this statue that I just showed you is probably um, a Shupiluliuma II. We think there's an earlier one that dates to sometime in the 10th century. But these are all discoveries that have been made in the last few years so if you remember that king list that I showed you drawn from Neo-Assyrian sources that were primarily 9th and 8th centuries, 
just in the span of less than a decade now, we've suddenly been able to add almost a half a dozen more king names that are extending back into the 10th century, maybe even into the 11th century. We're beginning to fill in the dark age, the, the political history of this period that we knew so little about um, just a few uh, years ago. And the other side of that from, let's, let's say, from using more modern uh, archeological methods like radiocarbon dating and other kind of chronometric methods, uh, we have been also be able to begin um, developing independent dating uh, methods or uh, evidence to support the chronologies that we are building from those inscriptions and from other lines of evidence. And so right here is an article that we just published literally last week that um, uh, produced a very nice line without going into the full science of this. But you can see, I think quite clearly here, a line of radiocarbon dates that are from a series of floors and contexts at the excavations including within the context of those sculptures that um, fall very nicely uh, straddling that 900 date, if you can see at the bottom here. So we are being able to pull together independent lines of evidence that are strengthening our case that we have a, a, a very tight history uh, that we can build for this early Iron Age context that we're interested in. So to step back, um, basically as of 2017, we had now found a whole series of sculptures. This is that temple, Building 16, that I mentioned earlier, that you saw the slide looking south into this excavation area. Essentially, what we believe we have found is part of a gate system that would have provided access from a lower part of the city up into this elite royal citadel zone that would have led into this area where these temples, these palaces, and other public buildings stood. And although they've all been destroyed and, 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 and deposited in various secondary or tertiary contexts, all these sculptures would have stood in some kind of configuration within this gate, monumental gate system, essentially marking a kind of approach up into this inner city or inner citadel uh, zone. And so an important concept that I, I believe we're looking at here is we're thinking, we should be thinking not only about this in a kind of military, uh, defensive sense, but also in a kind of um, conceptual, if not religious, sense of a kind of liminal space that marks very important um, spatial differences uh, within the context of these neo Hittite, uh, this neo Hittite uh, community, of how they are conceptualizing um, different parts of the site and, in a sense, kind of guarding and marking the transition from uh, different parts of the site. I'll come back to that point in closing. A couple other discoveries that were made going back to the Chicago excavations in the 1930s and also even before that should have hinted that we do actually have um, this kind of sculptural tradition include also this large head. We've come to call it the Colossus that you see here. It's kind of beaten up and so on, but clearly I think you can see that in its, in its prime, it would have been a quite a spectacular piece. And then there's this carved orthostat that shows a charioteer trampling over a vanquished foe who's lying here supine on the, on the ground. And I just single these out. These were found out of context or not in clear context, but I think they become more important as we proceed as I try to make the case for what I think uh, we have found and what, what the significance of it is. So in the bigger picture, uh, there are those public buildings again. Um, the head that I, the Colossus that I mentioned was found in this gateway area here that led from the lower city up to this upper mounded area. Our new citadel gate is right in this vicinity here that, as I said, we believe provided access up into this inner citadel or royal citadel zone. So when you try and conceptualize it, I think very much there was an intentionality to the builders of this area, this public space by these Neo-Hittite uh, rulers. And um, I think this is an important thing. I don't think it was simply just a kind of random organic exercise. I think they built in a very intentional way. And I think that there are very significant ideological as well as uh, religious and, and, and conceptual um, uh, aspects to why they did that. And I'll again, come back to that point a little bit later. But for now, just what, what we think we're beginning to uncover here is would have been a kind of public processional way, a ceremonial processional way that would have led from this gateway seven up to the new citadel gate that we had now begun uncovering. 
So this whole area was destroyed uh, probably by Tiglath Pileser III, who's the famous empire builder of the Neo Syrians, um, specifically in the year 738 during his second Western campaign. I don't have time to develop all of that historical narrative, but it's an important uh, historical moment where we see the site conquered. We have very detailed historical, contemporary historical records that describe that. And then we see its transformation from the royal city of the Neo-Hittite kingdom of Patina or Palestina into this provincial capital of an expanding Neo-Syrian empire. Again, that's another story for another day. So finally, to our last most recent discovery in our excavations that resumed in 2017, we began excavating in this area here between the area over here in the background where we had found these other sculptures we were hoping to be able to get back to mundane stratigraphic questions like I've been alluding to. Um, and so we moved over to this area that you can see marked in this red circle with the intent or with the hope that we could have that kind of um, uh, preserved deposition uh, that we could focus on. And as you can perhaps anticipate, within a couple days, we started coming down on yet another monumental sculpture. Uh, in this case, it was kind of a strange thing because what we found, as you can see in this photograph here, was um, this kind of round blob, and we didn't know what to make of it. And uh, finally, once we got deep enough and we were in a position to begin to remove it, to extract it, as it were, um, and we began to lift it up. Um, and you can hear the video if you're interested in this. I think it's on a YouTube video that was posted as a part of a, a CBC national uh, story when this first came out. Um, it was an incredible moment when uh, the, our staff realized that what we were looking at was the face of a female figure, a highly unique discovery um, in the sense that un until now, um, the corpus of monumental sculptures, not only from Thai, not from, from other contemporary sites, have been exclusively focused on male kings, rulers, uh, or lions, or uh, mythical creatures. And uh, here you see photographs of her after she had been lifted up and then we removed her and took her to the local museum. The other thing that of course immediately jumped out was the fact that her face was completely smashed and much of her, uh, her front had been uh, destroyed or damaged. And uh, it is certainly, we can say, um, something that was done in antiquity, probably contemporaneous with her being uh, deposited into the ground. In fact, our conservator, and was, it was, was able to try and uh, identify some of the kinds of tools. Um, there are different tools for, uh, that were used to truncate her, to cut off her torso, um, different kinds of tools that were involved with the kind of bludgeoning effect that would have been involved with uh, damaging her face and her, her chest area. So the other part of this that was quite interesting and important to us was that underneath her, we found a bed of thousands and thousands of fragments. And so we spent the rest of our summer fine gridding this area, the poor, uh, I, this was actually my excavation area. So I was involved with working with one of our students. It was one of the most tedious excavations you can imagine, trying to locate every fragment within its context and its relationship to all the other thousands of fragments. It was a very tedious exercise, but that's what you see being illustrated in this slide. Uh, we wanted to really preserve that contextual information, not only because we wanted to be able to put her together, if it, as it were, but we also believe that there's other fragments here, perhaps from other sculptures. And in fact, we found enough body parts, whether ears or other identifiable body parts that clearly do not belong to her, nor to any of the other sculptures that we've found, which indicate that we still have more to find, more discoveries to be made in the future. And this seems to have been a kind of preparatory zone where whoever was destroying or dismantling these sculptures essentially prepared them before they were ritually most likely deposited, in a sense kind of decommissioned as important uh, sacred uh, monuments uh, from the preceding era, from this Neo-Hittite culture that uh, we're looking at. So um, just right off the bat, as you can see her here, um, we found fragments right away that uh, were obviously her nose. And one of the stranger discoveries was this hand, which we had found a few seasons before in a nearby square in a, in a different context. 
but which uh, we were able to uh, confirm, in fact, belongs to her. And I'll show you that in a minute. So we began, and this is the first uh, kind of point, we began trying to debate and, 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 and comprehend what might have happened to her. Was this some kind of sort of misogynist, anti-female thing to destroy her um, and eradicate her image? Or was it something that had more to do with a broader political uh, motivation? And uh, as a, on that point, as a kind of anal potential analogous situation, um, we mentioned the Domnatio Memoriae, which is a well-known and well-documented Roman practice where imperial uh, emperors and, and rulers um, in later times would often be uh, sort of extracted or, or cut out of the memory of, uh, of imperial Rome, either in their monuments or in their written records. So maybe that's something that part of what's going on here. And of course, in the, in the, in the contemporary debates that we're seeing here in, even in Canada, about monuments and the re, um, you know, the repurposing of them or the dismantling of them, uh, is this perhaps something that's going on here? And so, actually, this has become an important academic discussion as well. In fact, one of our former students, uh, U of T students, has done some very important, insightful work on this that predates even, in fact, this most recent uh, modern debate about statues. Um, and the term that they're coining is counter monumentality. And in fact, just very quickly, a couple slides to illustrate this. Here is actually a, a, a relief, an orthostrat that was on the um, inner palace of Sargon, one of the great Neo-Syrian kings in his uh, royal city of Khorsabad. And um, it's actually a lost piece now. So that's why I don't have a good slide of it. We don't know what has become of this orthostrat. But you can see here a number of guys busily uh, chiseling away or chopping away at a, at a statue of some king here. So um, we already see uh, sort of almost a caught in the act scene of that. But within our Neo-Hittite context, what we began to realize is that this is actually quite common. I think we had sort of assumed that most of the damage on some of these uh, contemporary sculptures was accidental. Maybe, you know, they often seem to be the nose or other protrusions on the body. And perhaps it was just simply because they got banged around a bit. But in fact, as you begin to look at it more carefully, we realized that they were always focusing on the same body parts, either the eyes, the nose, the hands. And here you see, this is that Zingerli statue I showed you earlier. The hands have been very intentionally uh, removed. The nose, um, we see that also here on a statue from another contemporary site uh, in a place called Malatya. And even closer to home, uh, inscriptions that were found, two stela that were found just a few miles away from Tainat, that uh, make reference actually to the first of the two Shupiluliuma kings that I mentioned earlier in the king list. You have a picture of him here being led by the storm god. And in this particular stela, you can see his face. In the second stela, they're more or less, uh, the, the uh, accompanying inscription is more or less similar, so it reports more or less the same thing. But in this scene, again, you see the king being led by the storm god, now it's on a bull rather than on a lotus uh, plant that you saw in the preceding uh, stela. But in this case, his face has been very carefully and very intentionally chiseled out. So it seems very clear that this was an actual practice. This was something that was not uncommon, a kind of repurposing or re, uh, re monumentality or counter monumentality that was going on with these kinds of public monuments. Second point is to try and understand how they might fit into the context. And I mentioned earlier that we think we have kind of a royal public processional way, a ceremonial procession way that would have been a kind of stage for elaborate um, festivals, elaborate um, processions and other things that were happening as a part of the kind of royal elite activities of the Citadel. And so for that, just very quickly, I want to take a quick look at the site of Carchemish and it's very interesting because Carchemish, which is perhaps more famous as a Neo-Hittite site because of the excavations of the British back in the early 200, uh, part of the, uh, the 20, 1900s, early 20th century, again, involved uh, with, uh, by Leonard Woolley. Um, one of the things that's been kind of interesting is that we're finding a lot of parallels between Tainat and Carchemish. And I like to throw in this biblical reference. It's an oracle that deals with the Neo-Syrians. It's a completely different uh, sort of context than what we're looking at here today. But uh, Kalno is the ancient reference to the city of Kunalua, which we know to be the name of ancient uh, Tainat. So 
it's very interesting in this uh, little oracle in Isaiah that we see Carchemish being uh, in a kind of parallelism mentioned with, uh, with Tainot or ancient Kunlu or Kalnu. So there's probably some significant similarities. They, they were kind of like sister settlements that had common experiences. And that's my main point here. And so in those earlier Chicago excavations, um, they found uh, some amazing uh, public spaces, including this thing known as the, lawyer, the long wall release that led up to a gate system and an uh, elaborate gate system that led up to their royal citadel. So I think very similar context to what I, we're finding in our gate system at Tainot. And here very quickly are a series of scenes that were put together on these reliefs. And um, notice here the charioteer scene. Remember the piece that I showed earlier that I think um, harkens to a similar kind of parallel at Tainot. The other things that you can see here, particularly these three uh, reliefs here are of first, and here's just another slide of them, Kubaba, the mother of the gods, the mother goddess. And this is probably one of the most powerful and most significant of the Neo-Hittite um, uh, religious pantheon. And here you see her wearing a very elaborate head um, gear called a tholos, and uh, she's carrying a pomegranate. And in this case, it looks like it's a some kind of a um, piece of wheat or some kind of a plant. And next to her, very damaged, is a seated figure where we have part of a, again, very damaged hieroglyphic Luvian inscription, if you can see my cursor. And it talks about this person. And um, it's in the first person singular. We don't have her name preserved, and this is a kind. This is a, the best attempt. This kind of Latin um, uh, term here it means that the hieroglyphic Luvian specialists haven't been able to translate her name. But she says, "I am somebody. I am the country lord or the ruler Shuhi, and Shuhi was the king. We know him from other contexts." She says, I was his wife, his dear wife. And she goes on to say other things. So we actually have here, I believe, a kind of parallel, perhaps, to what we might have at Tainot. But it's very poorly preserved. Her face is not preserved. But you can see she's wearing a very distinctive kind of shawl. And that, I think, is significant. I'll come back to that point shortly. A little bit south of the processional wall is a gate called the King's Gate that also has a series of reliefs. And here you can see what are identified as uh, priestesses or courtiers. We actually don't really, really know who they were, but they're female. They also have a very similar kind of headdress. Um, again, what we're referring to as a tholos, and they're carrying similar kinds of symbols that we saw Kubaba, the mother goddess carrying. So we're pretty confident that they are somehow involved in processions or in rituals related to her um, cult, if you will. And then in that gate, right next to that row of uh, reliefs is an inscription, again, very poorly preserved. And it's preserved um, in the name of another king, a king by the name of Katuas. But he talks about how he built something, we're not sure exactly what, with wood, with upper floors for Anas, who he describes as my beloved wife or Tawanana. And this is significant because it's the name of his wife. So we have a second name here. In this case, the voice is in the person of the king, but he's referring to her as a Tawanana. And I, that's my la one of my last points. I will come back to that shortly. So um, in that same context, there's another relief uh, that we're not quite sure who it's represented. Here you can see the figure sitted, sitting. We think she was the sort of direction that those courtiers or priestesses, whoever, we're working towards in a kind of ceremonial, um, think of it like a kind of composition of scenes that um, progress towards her. And there's a debate about whether she, this is a representation of the mother goddess, Kubaba, or perhaps the Anas mentioned in the inscription in the nearby gate system. But notice she's carrying a pomegranate again, but in this case, she's carrying a mirror. This is another important symbol that we often find associated with Kubaba. I don't have time to explain all of these, the significance of some of these details, but here we have a slightly different headgear from how we saw Kubaba depicted in the long processional wall. So I'm inclined to think that this is perhaps a representation not of Kubaba, 
but of Anas, the wife of Kutawas, the um, Hittite king. So coming back to Tainat and to try and bring this to a, a conclusion, um, here is that scene again in the long uh, wall procession that I mentioned, where we see the wife of Shuhi, um, whose name eludes us. And we'll see that she's wearing, I think, a very similar kind of shawl to our female figure, a tie knot. So there's some iconographic, if you will, similarities or parallels here. And so um, this leads to the second point, which is um, not only that we think she was standing in the gate system as a, as a part of this kind of public space that would have been um, scenes or settings for or a stage, if you will, for elaborate uh, religious uh, ceremonies, processions, and rituals, but we think that she's being depicted um, similar to the scene on the relief that you see in the example from Carchemish. Now, this is speculating, but in fact, and this is one of the things that makes archaeology so exciting, when you find a new discovery, you go back and look at things that had been around for a long time that we didn't understand, and suddenly they take on new light. And this is very quickly uh, what has been happening since our discovery in 2017. In the last few years, we've been going back through material that were found in some cases, for example, in the uh, sites of Meherde and Shazar, two little villages near Hama and uh, to the south, inscriptions that were found almost 70 years ago. Uh, here we have a representation, a memorial stela of a female figure. It's a very poorly preserved inscription but it refers to now one of the kings of Taina, Teta. We're confident we know who this person was, that he was one of the early kings. And this seems to be a memorial stela erected in memory of his wife. Although the inscription is not so well preserved, you can see here on this uh, line drawing that it's clearly a female figure and significantly she's standing on one of these lion figures that you can see there. There's a second one, however, and that's the Shazar inscription is better preserved and we can read it more clearly. And it starts up here with that first person singular pronoun, I. And it's one of the most remarkable inscriptions, uh, I think in the ancient Iron Age, first millennium Near East. It's an autobiographical statement preserved in the first person of a female figure, specifically the wife, we think, that's the translation of this King Teta. So it's another memorial uh, stela for possibly the same person preserved in the previous uh, stela that I just mentioned. And she says, I am Kupi Papias, the wife of Tetas, who is the hero or the ruler of Palestine. She goes on to describe how she lived a life of uh, a just life. She lived for a long time, over a hundred years. She describes her generations, multiple generations of children. She talks about a stela that her children have you know, raised uh, probably in her memory. And uh, she goes on to describe how um, should anybody do any kind of harm to them, um, then uh, may the divine queen of the land prosecute them. And the divine queen of the land, we believe, is a reference to Kubaba. And we can also say that Kupapias is almost certainly a kind of religious theophoric representation of Kubaba. So she's identifying herself as closely with the uh, mother goddess figure here. So this is these are all details that are starting to come together, which lead me to suggest that in fact the statue that we have from Taina, we think, is a representation of a human figure, um, the, the queen mother, if you will, um, of the dynasty at uh, Taina. One last piece that we have is again a forgotten piece, just a few miles away from Taina, um, this place called Kipjolu, found this rather beaten up piece, but I was stunned when I went back and realized that this is in fact something we had more or less been ignoring. And it's got a very poorly preserved inscription on it, but it also makes reference to the divine queen of the land. This is most likely a female figure. We had not assumed that, we just never thought about it to be honest, but it's probably a representation of a female figure as well making reference to this divine queen of the land. So what's, what I'm getting at is that we've gone back and we've begun to discover there's actually was evidence out there that we have really realized suggesting that in fact, there's something going on here that involves a very important place and role for a female figure who we think was essentially functioning as a kind of uh, queen mother figure who was closely aligned in a religious sense with the mother goddess Kubaba and 
What we do know about the Tawanana, as they were called, these queen mothers, is preserved from the Bronze Age. So this is one of the things that takes us back to this much earlier context where we have detailed accounts of the very important and prominent role that these Tawanana played. Um, essentially, when they became the queen mother, they held that post until they died, even if the ruling kings changed over the same time period. And they um, would take over uh, the political, the economic decision-making during periods of time when the king was away on campaigns. And perhaps most significantly, they played a very prominent role uh, in, in this cult or in the religious rituals and activities associated with the very prominent mother goddess figure, uh, Kubaba. So this is what I am proposing we have here is a representation of a human figure of a mother, um, a queen mother figure who perhaps begins to be initially to be immortalized, but then begins to take on a kind of divine status over time. And this is admittedly uh, speculating, but my last couple quick slides here are to remind you that we found these twin temples and we have evidence from earlier contexts that I don't have time to unpack now that describes these twin temples as essentially the residences of a divine couple. The male uh, god uh, deity, which is usually the storm god, the name changes depending on the geographical and cultural and historical context, but, and something that has been only relatively recently appreciated, the storm god always had a, a partner. And um, in our Iron Age context, what I think we're beginning to uh, come towards is a realization that Kubaba played that divine couple role. And we have here preserved actually religious architecture and a kind of sacred precinct that was inside this gate. Remember I was describing it as a kind of liminal space that would lead into this inner sanctuary, this inner sacred precinct. And we have physical archeological evidence now just from our own very recent excavations, two temples, which suggests that there was a kind of duality here and uh, why we've begun calling them a tw twin temples, very likely the home, if you will, the residence of two divine uh, beings. And what we're proposing is essentially a divine couple. And so this is, these are some of the pieces that are coming to beginning to come together. It's truly transforming and, and completely revolutionizing, I believe, our understanding of uh, these uh, Iron Age cultures and especially the role of women in these very important uh, religious and also political uh, leadership contexts. So the last quick point is that this tradition continues. And as we get down into the classical period of Antioch, we actually have a stunning similar image of a, of a female figure with this kind of shawl called the Antioch Kernon that's from the Hellenistic and later period carved on the cliffs overlooking the classical city. And perhaps most dramatically, we have the patron goddess of Antioch, Tike. So clearly there is this kind of tradition that is elevated in time um, that begins to take on more prominence in the classical period. Obviously something we don't have time to discuss here, but I believe there's a continuity here that we can trace back into this Neo-Hittite Iron Age uh, context. My final point, and this is the part that's just in the last couple of weeks, uh, here you see slides of our efforts to begin putting together the female statue. You see the thousands of fragments I was alluding to here in the museum uh, uh, lab that we've been working with. Uh, one of my colleagues, Steve Batrick, uh, using rather sophisticated software to help develop three-dimensional kind of, uh, uh, we call it shape matching algorithms to help us uh, begin piecing together this really uh, complex uh, sort of jigsaw puzzle. And the last most recent piece is that I mentioned the Chicago pieces that were found in the 1930s. We've got a record of them. And here is a piece that we have long wondered about it's sitting in the basement of the Chicago Oriental Institute Museum. And um, we uh, were trying to figure out whether it might relate to our female statue. And here you see her. Remember the hand that I showed you earlier, that's in place. So that's a very clear and secure uh, join. And here you see her in a more oblique angle. And just a couple of weeks ago, our conservator realized that that piece fits on her uh, left breast, if uh, I got my left and right is correct here, you can see. And, and this is the part that's really got us all agitated and excited, 
if you zoom in on that slide, you see here a hand. And you're probably going to have to take my word for it a little bit. But if you recall the Shazar inscription that I just mentioned, that autobiographical statement of uh, the Queen Mother Kupipapias, the first person singular is this motif. We are very confident that what we're looking at here is the beginning of that symbol. And just for another example, here is the same um, pronoun, the first person singular pronoun on the inscription of Shupiluyuma, and you can see a close up of it. So we've actually found the join for both hands and her left breast and the first sign of the beginning of an inscription. So we're excited because we're trying to find out and figure out who this person or this representation is or was, but we're also hoping and we're inching closer to actually giving her a voice. We think that we've got the beginning here of an inscription that starts with I and the next sign that of course eludes us at the moment, hopefully uh, we'll be able to find that piece shortly that would probably preserve her name and we would be able to name her. I am, and that's where we have to leave it for today. So we're slowly beginning to put her back together again. We're slowly beginning to unpack who she might have been and also the larger historical, social and cultural significance that she represented in this early Iron Age context that as I said, was a time of really innovative, creative um, and exciting um, intellectual and cultural ferment. Thank you very much for your time and patience. And I just want to, in closing, acknowledge the tremendous collective help of the staff. You see a photograph of some of our staff. We have an amazing team uh, of amazing people who have made it possible for me to give you this kind of uh, snapshot of some of the results of our excavations. We've also benefited from many foundations from the University of Toronto itself that has been very supportive along the way. So I just wanna acknowledge them and my ability to present this talk this afternoon is entirely dependent on that collective act, uh, effort. So thank you very much. And I turn it over, I believe to Erin. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Harrison. That was amazing. Those sculptures and the, the carvings are breathtaking. Um, so we've had quite a few questions come in. Um, so we're gonna um, go through a few of them, but just due to timing, we won't be able to cover all of them. Um, but let's see here. Um, so one of the earlier questions we had was uh, with regard to the, uh, the lion sculptures earlier on. Um, someone was wondering whether you found tools that were used to carve those lions, or I guess any of the sculptures. Do you find tools nearby usually when you find? So that's a hard question. And the short answer is no. But that is where we're going to next. And what I mean by that is that what we found and with the context that we've been excavating is essentially where these monuments were standing, where they were on display, which we have been, what I've argued this afternoon was the, the sort of elite zone, the Royal Citadel. And we believe that these sculptures were probably being produced in essentially what we might describe as workshops in the, in the lower city. And one of the things, and this is a kind of a, an obsession or a fault of us as archeologists, even though there's been more than a hundred years of archeological exploration of these Iron Age communities, almost exclusively that interest and that focus has been on the elite zones. We've done almost no investigation collectively as a scholarly community of the residential, the domestic, and the sort of, let's say, industrial parts of this community. So, and that's certainly been the case at Tainan, and we've perhaps perpetuated that by the fact that our excavations to date have focused in that um, sort of upper mound, Royal Citadel elite zone. But we have just put a proposal forward and we're hoping to be able to get permission to can start uh, uh, conducting excavations in the lower mound, that area that's in this sort of floodplain that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, where we believe we'll find the um, workshops or the places where they were crafting these sculptures and the other um, kinds of art objects that I alluded to. Um, we have hints of it when we did the surface collection and we found fragments of half finished objects and so on, bits and pieces of material that suggest that we are sort of on top of the spot where we think they were crafting these uh, monuments and these sculptures and these art objects. 
But today, nobody, not just tie knot project, but none of the projects that I, that I'm, to my knowledge, no one has actually found those production contexts yet. So we haven't found the tools or the, the places where they made them, but we're hoping to, that's perhaps something we can report on in the future. Um, if we're able to get back into the field over the next few summers and uh, conduct excavations, it's very much our hope to be able to find that kind of evidence. Oh, that's actually interesting in and of itself too. Okay. Um, okay, so the next one here, I don't want to butcher any of these. Um, uh, this question says, um, does the name Wallaston slash Palestine have any relation to the name that appears in other texts, um, PLST, that may refer to a particular group of people? I don't know if that was, was that coherent? So that's a topic that I kind of just brushed over. Um, there is a term, and what I think this questioner is asking about is the term Peleset. So in the early 12th century, we have in Egypt, in uh, Western Thebes, in the mortuary temple of Ramses III, this gets into kind of uh, details, but I think that this person is probably um, interested in that point. There is a scene, it's called the Sea People's Invasion. There is a scene that's carved on the north wall of the mortuary temple of Ramses III that depicts these so-called sea peoples who were invading or migrating um, into the delta of Egypt and perhaps along the Levantine coast. And there are, and there are at least five different um, sort of ethnic or, or, or groups, sea peoples groups named in that inscription. And one of them is the Peleset. And yes, um, the uh, historians who have been working on these inscriptions, these hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions, including the ones that make reference specifically to Palestine, have made the connection to the Peleset. They have proposed that they are referring to the same ethnic uh, uh, designation. And then if that's accepted, then the question becomes, well, is it a, a, a geographical region? And increasingly now, I think uh, scholars are coming around to the view that in fact, that the answer to that question is yes. And that that geographical area perhaps is this area of the Northern Levant where we are working in which Tainat was perhaps the, uh, emerged as kind of the royal city or capital of this uh, kingdom of Palestine or the, the land of the Peleset. In the Egyptian um, context, it makes reference to the land of the Peleset. And it's very similar to the reference on the Aleppo inscriptions that talk about the land of Palestine. So, um, and, and, and by the way, then the next step, perhaps if you're anticipating, those of you who know your biblical history, are these, what relationship do they have to the Philistines? And uh, there is some kind of connection there, but it's an elusive one. And it's a, I can, uh, trust me, it's a highly um, animated debate right now about what those historical connections are. And I can't, it's, it's a whole enormous topic on its own, but there does seem to be some kind of broader cultural and historical connection. It's all part of what's happening in this dark age, this early iron age context that I've alluded to throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. It's a very dynamic and uh, fluid uh, and complex situation. And these different historical and ethnic kind of uh, terms and names and, and peoples that we're getting tidbits of are all part of the mix. Great, great. Okay. Um, one of the questions we had was about the symbols, <clears throat> uh, the recurring symbols in some of the, um, I guess, specifically women's carvings. Um, could you maybe mention what some of the symbols like the wheat or the pomegranate might have had in those carvings? So, so the uh, I'm getting it. Back. I don't know if it's my side. Um, if you can hear me, okay. So um, we're still trying to understand some of them, and um, I will also be brutally honest. I'm starting to move beyond my own expertise. I'm not the most knowledgeable of the um, the larger religious iconography of some of these, but um, they do tend to focus on things like um, fertility, reproduction. Um, agricultural themes, uh, those are all very important di dimensions, not only of Kubaba and her capacity as the mother goddess. Um, and so some of those symbols are, are absolutely related to that. Um, one of the more elusive and but also I think interesting uh, symbols is the mirror. And um, 
I have, I have a colleague, a close friend who's been working on this and she's been trying to uh, develop that. And I'm not gonna try and anticipate where she's gonna go on that. I'm, I'm just gonna leave it at this. Other than that, these are very symbolically significant uh, things. They're not just accidental things that someone just put them in their hands. They're a very important part of what the rituals and the activities and the significance of the, uh, of, of the um, of the, uh, in this case of Kubaba, of the, of the mother goddess, what she was about, what she represented, what she was doing. And we're still, yeah, absolutely trying to sort of figure that all out. Great, okay. Um, so I have one last question here. Um, does the figure of the Iron Age Sidonian Queen Jezebel provide any hint of the power of these city queens? So I was running, a team, so I chose not to develop that, but absolutely. The short answer is yes. Um, what we're beginning to realize is that there's a broader, we can actually put it, put the, what's happening with the so-called Tawanana within this Hittite cultural context into a broader ancient Near Eastern one. And in the biblical context, um, absolutely, there are quite a few um, examples that we have preserved in biblical account stories like Jezebel, like the, um, there's also, um, there's a whole, there's the um, a wife of Sisera. I mean, I don't have time to explain all of them if you don't know your biblical history, but there is absolutely um, actually quite a lot of good examples, analogous examples of very powerful um, queen mother figures in the biblical context that we think are in terms of their role and the significance of what they represented within Israelite society were analogous to what was happening in the Near Hittite context. And one other quick point is that what we're discovering is that those mother, queen mothers were also closely aligned to the sort of Israelite parallel of the mother goddess figure, um, Asherah. There's again, there's a whole nother uh, discussion about um, this, but uh, there seems to be a, a common connection um, within that Israelite context. So there is a lot, we can go into other cultural examples as well, not just the Israelite one. There's quite a, quite a rich, um, contemporary um, um, uh, examples that we can draw on. And that's exactly what we're sort of doing right now is beginning to realize. Um, like I said, this is one of the things that makes us exciting is that we, we've, I mean, I mean, I don't say this as a proud thing, we've kind of ignored, uh, frankly, and, and we've just been ignorant of a lot of this. And now when we make these discoveries, it's really, you know, bringing us back and realizing that there's enormous amount of importance um, aspects here of the role of women that we haven't recognized and attended to. And that's a lot of what's happening right now is going back and looking at a lot of, uh, a lot of evidence that we've sort of glossed by in the past as scholars of this time period in this region. Great. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of stuff that we could go over perhaps in future lectures. Um, so um, I, but I appreciate everything we did cover. I know I have lots of other questions too, but I won't take up anyone's time with those. Um, so uh, I want to thank everyone for their questions. Um, we can't cover all of them, um, but I'd like to move this over to Barbara then to uh, thank Professor Harrison. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Barbara Track, and I am the Executive Director of Advancement Alumni and Development at Woodsworth College. And I wanted to thank Tim for his excellent and fascinating uh, presentation this afternoon. It was a lovely opportunity to travel to a different place in time, especially during these very bizarre times. And um, as Aaron said, I think we'd be happy to have you back to um, elaborate on some of the things that you talked about and um, to see other things that are going on in that wonderful part of the world. So on behalf of the Woodsworth College Alumni Association and Woodsworth College, I want to thank you um, for taking the time to uh, be with us this afternoon and to everyone who joined us, thank you very much. And if you would like to visit our website, you can see other things that we're up to. Um, and I wish everybody a uh, wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara and everyone. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Okay, we're going to.